Hey everybody, welcome to the next in our Bible study series this summer that we are calling uh, God Our Deliverer. It is a study of the first eight chapters of the book of Judges, and uh, you are going to need your Bibles open to Judges chapter 6 today or your Bible app. Uh, also, there is a listening guide for this lesson, and you'll find it at the same place you found uh, this video. Just scroll down and click on it download that PDF and uh, print it out. There are some blanks you can fill in during the lesson portion, but much more importantly than that, there are some discussion questions there for you to begin discussing these truths back and forth with your own small group or your own family. I hope you're doing that as well. Now, before we jump into the lesson today, let's pray, shall we? We're aware, Father, that um, the world we are living in feels very much broken and very lost. We are aware as well that uh, there are so many competing interests and competing voices screaming at us. Um, and yet, Father, we are as Christ followers also aware that the only voice that matters in the end is yours. The only truth that exists in the end is yours, the truths that we find in your word. And so our prayer, even today, Lord, is that you will help us to chip away at the false truths that this world has taught us, that you will uh, replace them with etern the, the eternal truths that come from your word, and that through that renewing of our mind, Father, you will continue the transformation process in each of us, that you'll change us as a result of gathering here together around your word today. We love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the seventh of our uh, lessons, and uh, this lesson is actually going to be beginning a new chapter, a new season, so to speak, in this series, because all of the next seven lessons uh, in this series will be all on one judge, all on the story of, story of Gideon, beginning with Judges chapter 6, We'll have a couple of lessons in chapter 6, a couple of lessons in chapter 7, and then into chapter 8, and all of it covers uh, this judge Gideon. And so this is kind of just the first of the Gideon lessons today. Uh, just as a reminder, though, where we've been so far, we, we are catching the people of Israel in God's story. We're catching them at uh, that several hundred year period of time right after they came into the Promised Land. Uh, the government has, has decentralized. There is no more single leader of the nation of Israel. Uh, the, the way you'll hear it in the book of Judges often is in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Uh, the tribes were splitting out. They were taking in over the land that had been allotted to them. Uh, and then as that process happened, the people as a whole began to pull further and further away from God. And so the whole book of Judges is this continuing downward spiral further and further away from God. And, and that brings consequences. As they pull further away from God and as they deliberately disobey God uh, with regard to the surrounding uh, cultures and worship of the surrounding gods, as they continue to do that, consequences follow. And the consequences are often that a neighboring country or people that, that they were supposed to oust from the land like the Canaanites are still there and still bothering them and still enslaving them. And God permits that to happen. And then they would cry out to the Lord and he would raise up a judge and deliver them. And then it would all happen all over again. And that's the cycle that we're seeing, this, this cycle of rebellion. A couple of weeks ago, we had a lesson on Ehud, Ehud which was a lesson about uh, raising up a leader that would stand against power. And then last week, uh, we, we looked at a trio of heroes, a trio of people, uh, Deborah and Jael, two women, and then a military leader named Barak, uh, and had a lesson on uh, God delivering the people of Israel through that trio of heroes. And so we start today with Gideon. And today's lesson uh, really is all about identity. It couldn't be more relevant to our current culture because there is so much talk today in our culture about identity and where do we find our identity. And, uh, and so today's lesson really speaks to that. Who gets to, it answers the question, who gets to tell us who we are? Such an important question. Who gets to tell us who we are? 
uh, and we'll see the answer to that question as we get into the lesson today. So after Deborah and Barak and Jael were uh, to worked together to deliver the people of Israel, they, the land had rest for another 40 years, and then problems began again. Again, the people of Israel began to pull away, and so we'll, we'll see that begin to unfold uh, in Judges chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, and here's how it, here's how it sounds. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And again, we've, we've said this many times, but did what was evil in the sight of the Lord kind of implies that God realized that they were rebelling and that they weren't doing this right, but they may not have been self-aware enough to even know that they were doing wrong. It was evil in the sight of the Lord, not necessarily in their own sight, because in their sight, every man was doing right in his own eyes. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. So they were, they were creating hiding places to hide from the Midianites. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them and they would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel, and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, and they would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted, so that they laid waste the land as they came in, and Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and here it is again, and the people of Israel cried out for help. To the Lord. So it's this same cycle, same cycle of rebellion. The people are getting further and further away from God. They're beginning to worship the gods of the, of the other uh, uh, people around them. And as that happens, then God permits the consequences to follow. The consequences in this case were the people of Midian beginning to, uh, to torment them. Uh, both, in this case, we see both Israel and God, both acting very predictably. In that regard, I mean that the people of Israel are doing what they've done in this cycle over and over and over again. It's not unusual. And God also acts predictably by allowing the consequences to flow for, for this, this rebellion and this sinful attitude on their part. Let's talk about the Midianites for just a second. The Midianites... Uh, this is not their first reference in Scripture. In fact, we see them quite a few times referenced in God's story, all, uh, even leading up to this. You may or may not, may or may not remember that uh, the slave traders who uh, Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery um, and, and he ended up in Egypt, those slave traders were in fact Midianites. The Midianites were kind of a nomadic people. They moved around quite a bit. And, uh, and that he, he was sold to Midianites. Moses' father-in-law uh, was a Midianite priest. When Moses, uh, who was raised in, the, in, the, uh, in Pharaoh's court, left uh, Pharaoh's court and for 40 years became um, a, a shepherd out in the wilderness, he was a shepherd with his father-in-law, uh, and his father-in-law was Midianite. And so the, the, as a result of that, his father-in-law's people, the uh, many Midianites who called themselves Kenites, they were a specific kind of Midianites, they ended up leaving and coming through the wilderness with Moses uh, into the Promised Land. Uh, they, uh, they were a people that were from the east ordinarily, uh, from east of Israel. And, and this occupation, the, the way the Midianites would occupy their territory, because they were nomadic people, it wasn't like a, a typical occupation. They would continue to, to live in their own territory, but every time the sea, it was seasonal, the occupation was seasonal. Every time the, the crop planting season would come about and the crops would be raised in Israel, the Midianites would come in like a swarm of locusts and take everything, take all the cattle, take all of the, the oxen, take all of the crops, and then go back home with it and leave the people of Israel with nothing. And so uh, this kind of an occupation was really much more of kind of a schoolyard bully. It was kind of like that schoolyard bully who steals your, your lunch money every single day when you come to lunch so that he leaves you with nothing. Uh, that, that was really much more like uh, what this occupation was like. And so Israel, in order to avoid the Midianites, they headed for the hills. They, they, they headed up into the mountains and they created homes in the mountains and caves where they could literally hide from this schoolyard bully. Uh, that was more this, like this swarm of locusts that would come and swarm over them. And so uh, Israel began to cry out. The people began to cry out to God for help. Um, they knew 
that these circumstances were not what God wanted for them. They knew, they remembered at least enough about their God that this was not what God desired for them. This was not his ideal um, for, for them. It's not what his vision for them was. They knew at least that much, right? They knew at least enough uh, uh, to, to know that God, that God didn't want this for them. Unfortunately, they didn't allow that vision that God had for them, however, to define them. They never allowed that vision for God to become their own vision that would, in fact, define them the way God wanted to define them. And so they chose their own identity. They went with their own feelings. Everyone was doing what was right in his own mind. And so that is why they got to these circumstances. Um, In in that regard, I think it's important for us as well to realize that um, we are not defined by the consequences that flow, the negative consequences in our life that flow as a result of our sinful behaviors. Even though we bring them on ourselves, those negative consequences do not define us. That is not our identity. It's certainly not what God had in mind for us. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the first blank on your listening guide. When God permits consequences to flow from our rebellious or otherwise bad decisions, those painful circumstances do not define us. Rather, they should drive us back toward the one who does define us. The point, the whole point of God permitting consequences to flow from our bad decisions is so that those consequences will get our attention and drive us back toward Him so that we can get back to the identity that He had in mind for us from the very beginning. But uh, those negative consequences are not our identity, and that's an important concept to take away from this lesson in terms of identity. So God's initial response to the people crying out for help is a little bit different this time. This story in Judges stands out as, uh, in, in a couple of different ways, and one of the ways is that, that God responds differently this time. He doesn't immediately raise up a judge to deliver the people. Rather, what he does in this instance is send a prophet to remind the people of Israel of whose they are. Listen to this beginning in verse 7. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. In other words, you shall not respect them. You shall not worship them. But you have not obeyed my voice. And so we don't know who this prophet is that God sent. It's a completely unnamed prophet. We've never heard from this prophet before this, and we will never hear from this prophet in God's story again after this. Who knows who he is? But, uh, but the prophet came and, and reminded the people of who their God is and exactly what their God had done for them in the past. It's interesting that this prophet, though, is not the deliverer, is not who God would raise up to deliver the people from the Midianites. It's also interesting that in this prophecy, this prophet, unlike most of the prophets in the Bible, this prophet, there is no call to action here. There, there, there is no call to repentance to the people of Israel. There, there is nothing that, where the prophet is saying, and therefore you should turn and come back to the Lord your God. No, the, the, the prophet... The prophet's only message from God is to remind the people of whose they are, to remind them that they belong to God, their God, who saved them and brought them into this land. And and so that's an important takeaway for us in in terms of identity when we're thinking about uh, our own identity is we, we we need people in our lives who will remind us of whose we are, who will remind us of what it means to be not only an image bearer of God, but for those of us who follow Christ, uh, to have the Holy Spirit indwelling in in us. Uh, And and so we need friends, we need shepherds, we need people in our lives who will will remind us of whose we are, even as we cry out to God, 
even in the midst of our struggles, maybe especially in the midst of our struggles, we need friends and family who will remind us of God's place in our lives. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the, the second statement on your listening guide now. In our most painful seasons, even those brought on by our own choices, we need friends who will remind us of whose we are. That is, remind us of God's place in our lives. Such an important concept. It's one of the reasons God created us for community is so that we can be there for each other to remind one another of whose we are, especially in times of struggles. And so now we are, for the first time, introduced to our main character, frankly, for the next seven weeks, for the next seven studies. His name is Gideon, beginning in verse 11. Now, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian, and the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I, do not I send you? Do not I send you? All right. Let's stop here and unpack some of this. And let's start with who is the angel of the Lord? What an interesting concept. And in virtually every English translation of Scripture, uh, he is referred to as the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. So what exactly does that mean and who is this angel of the Lord? Well, first of all, we, we, when we look at all of the places in Scripture where the angel of the Lord is referenced, we recognize that it's not just an angel. The angel of the Lord is not a mere angel the way Gabriel or Michael <clears throat> are. This is not like the angel who came to Mary to, to tell her that she was going to have a baby that was born of the Spirit. Uh, this is a, a, a much more important central figure than just another angel. Uh, we are reminded in, this, in Genesis uh, of, of Hagar when Hagar is confronted by the angel of the Lord and tells her uh, what she should do. We're reminded in Mos with Moses, the story of Moses in the burning bush, the angel of the Lord appeared in the form of a burning bush. Uh, the angel of the Lord then went before the people of Israel and, and, and led them through the wilderness. It was the angel of the Lord appearing in a column of fire and a column of smoke by night and day to lead the people through the wilderness. It was the angel of the Lord who took up residence in the tabernacle when the people in the wilderness built the tabernacle per God's instructions. And so what, what we understand is that this angel of the Lord is much better more important and higher than just an angel. And it, it, in some regards, when the story, when each of these stories takes place, you see the same kind of progression. Uh, uh, and, and there are others, by the way, other stories of the angel of the Lord in Scripture. When the angel of the Lord is referenced in Scripture, it always starts by referring to it as the angel of the Lord. But then once the interaction with the human begins, it just begins, it just slips into calling it the Lord, God himself. And so is it God himself or is it some other form of God? And let me just hit stop here and say we're not altogether sure. I think, I think Scripture is intentionally mysterious uh, around this topic. But, but the, the, one of the illustrations that comes to my mind is um, it, it, it's almost like this is the angel of the Lord is the vehicle that God uses to present himself to human beings for the very reason that human beings cannot look upon God and survive the, the experience. And so it's almost like it's almost like a FaceTime with God, if you will. Uh, if, if, if I were to FaceTime you and you were looking at me on your phone, you would be talking to me and addressing me as if you're talking directly to me, but you know that that device that you're holding in your hand is not Blake. That's just 
the way Blake is appearing to you through FaceTime. And, and that's, this is not a perfect illustration, it's not a perfect metaphor, but it's the closest I can come to at least capturing my understanding of what, what the angel of the Lord is. When the angel of the Lord surfaces and, 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 and shows himself in Scripture, it is very much like a FaceTime with God because the person that ends up talking with God is talking directly to God and God is talking directly back to them through this vehicle that we call the angel of the Lord. And what the angel of the Lord says to, uh, to Gideon, and this really is the very heart of this lesson, is this first address where the angel says, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now, that is such an interesting, such an interesting way to describe these circumstances because Gideon, who we will later find out is the, the youngest, the least of his family, the youngest and the least of his family, and his family is the least in the entire tribe, and his tribe is the least, right? And, and he is literally, he is literally hiding from the schoolyard bully at the time the angel of the Lord says, O mighty man of valor. He has, he has taken what little wheat crop he has already raised, just enough probably for him and his family, a small amount, enough that would fit easily into a wine press, which is just a big, uh, a big place where they would stamp grapes. And he had put the wheat down in this wine press in this hole down in the ground. And it's a horrible place for threshing wheat because the whole point of threshing wheat usually is up on a mountaintop where the wind is blowing and you, and you thresh the wheat and the shaft is blown, blown away and you're left with just the kernels. And he's doing it down in a hole where there is no wind and, and it, because he's a coward, because he's scared to death of the Midianites. And, and so it's ironic that the angel of the Lord addresses him and says, Oh, man of valor. But you see from the very outset of this encounter, God sees Gideon for whom he is. He sees the truth about Gideon. Gideon himself doesn't even see the truth about himself. But from the very beginning, God sees Gideon in a certain way, in the way that he wired Gideon from the beginning, in the way that he wired him even in the womb for these kinds of things. Uh, irrespective of anything Gideon is doing or is saying, this is the very definition, isn't it, of identity? In other words, it's not about the things that Gideon does. It's not about the things that he says. It's not about who his family is. It's not about his feelings. It's not about all the ways that he, the, that he tends to doubt, right? It's not about his own doubts. It's not about his own fears. His identity is about any of those things. His identity is the way God wired him. And that is such the important takeaway in today's lesson. His, 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 his identity is not tied to his present circumstances, but it's also not tied to his doubts, nor even to his beliefs. It's not tied to any of those things. When, when we hear the questions that he asks, saying, how can you say the Lord is with us when the Lord's not doing any of the things? If, if the Lord is with us, then why are these things happening? That seems like a very natural question, but it also is a question that that indicates he, his faith is very small if it exists at all. His, his understanding is very naive with regard to spiritual things. And so he is not being defined by his beliefs, by his doubts, by his fears, or by his circumstances. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the next blank in your listening guide. As God's people, we are who God says we are. Our core identity is not about our circumstances, nor our feelings, nor our doubts, nor our beliefs. Our identity is exactly what our Creator says it is. The Creator who created us in the womb. New Testament scripture in, in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, you, were, you, you are God's craftsmanship, you are God's workmanship, created to do good things. He pre-wired you pre-wired you and me to do, to and accomplish certain things. And so he knew what he created Gideon to do. And he's just acknowledging that from the very beginning. So Gideon has then some questions. If this is true, if I am to be uh, a deliverer, then I've got some questions because there's a lot that doesn't make sense to me. Verse 15, and, and he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But 
I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Now, we'll get into this in future lessons, this idea of him striking the Midianites as one man, but let's just stop here and pause and reflect and remember that the whole strength of the Midianites was their sheer number. They were like a swarm of locusts. And so imagine, if you will, striking them down as one man. And we're going to get into that in, in lessons in the coming weeks about the numbers not really mattering to God. It's not about the numbers. And so what God is saying is um, after Gideon recounts for God, as if God didn't know, Gideon recounts for God, you recognize who you're talking to about here. He recounts for him how small he and his family are. But at the same time, God then recounts, recounts for Gideon how big he, God, is and that with him, it doesn't matter how small Gideon is. Uh, uh, we have a friend, Tara Kuba, from our international ministry who, uh, who learned this lesson in a particular way that I've always found really helpful. Um, she would say, all of us, all of us come from a long line of zeros. I'm a zero, my, pe my family's a zero, my grandparents were zeros, we're all zeros. And so when you put that line all together, we amount to zero. But when you put God, the number one, in front of all those zeros, then the number changes. And so the value changes. The value changes suddenly from nothing to this enormous number with all these zeros behind it, as long as that one is in front of you. You take away the one, and it's just a bunch of zeros. And I love that. I love that illustration. Uh, that, that's exactly what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 15 when he says, don't you understand, I'm the vine and you are the branches. And if a man remains in me and I in him, then he will bear much fruit. The one with all the zeros, it's a highly valuable, it's a high value. But apart from me, he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You take the one away and it's just a bunch of zeros. And th that, that is the exact concept that we're seeing here now with Gideon. Gideon is saying, I'm a zero. My family's a zero. My tribe's a bunch of zeros. And God says, that's right. All of that is correct. But when you put me in front, all of a sudden it's an enormous, um, un un incomprehensible value. The key then is for us as Christ followers, the key is abiding in Christ, remaining in Christ and, how, and allowing Him to abide in us. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the, the last blank on your listening guide. How important is God with us in terms of our spiritual productivity? Without it, no other strengths matter. With it, no other weaknesses matter. Those are your blanks to fill in. Without God, none of our other strengths matter. But with God, none of our weaknesses matter. And so here are some observations in summing up about who gets to tell us who we are. Where do we find our identity as God's people? First of all, the consequences of our sinful choices, those consequences do not define us. Second of all, uh, we do need friends in our life who will remind us of whose we are of who our God is uh, and who God is for us. Uh, thirdly, we, we, we know that our, our doubts and our beliefs, likewise, do not define us. And then lastly, God is the one who gets to tell us who we are. Our Creator is the one who defines us. And when He is with us, none of our other weaknesses matter because He is all we need. I love this lesson on identity. It's so, so relevant to where we are today in our culture. I hope you're liking these lessons as well, and we will pick up right here where we've left off in chapter 6. We'll pick up there next week. Uh, in the meantime, I love you guys. Hope you have a blessed week.